Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is seventh period with a bunch of AP biologists. Say hi. Hi. Oh my gosh, this is pathetic. Hi. Um, <laughs> first thing you want to know, there is no shadow. Oh, God bless. Don't ask. Don't ask. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, don't ask, because maybe she'll forget to add a shadow. No, I wrote it, and I just, I was too lazy to write a shadow, so I just, eh, that's good. <laughs> All right, so chapter 36, body fluid regulation and excretory systems, let's hit some main points. you got to have water in, water equaling water out. Um, we talked about um, the way to take care of maintaining our water balance is always going to be about ions, because water is always going to flow from the hypo. Yeah. And... Um, we talked about the structure, or you did in your ad puzzle, of an amino acid. And this becomes important because of our nitrogenous waste and um, where they originate from. You could get it from the breakdown of a protein. Proteins are built with amino acids. You might be able to take this particular amino acid and convert it to another amino acid and be useful. Awesome. But if you want to burn this amino acid in cellular respiration, you're not going to burn the amino group, so you have to remove that amino group. Now, when you remove it, it usually gets removed. There could be another hydrogen there, right? It could be NH3, and what do we call NH3? Ammonia. ammonia. And for most systems, ammonia is going to be what to it? Toxic. 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 <laughs> the only one that's not going to be toxic is if you have copious amounts of what? Water. Water. Okay? Now, for us, let's just go ahead and jump to us in applying. Where this process of removing that amino group is called, there is a term. Oh, D. Yes, deamination. Say it. Deamination. Now let's listen to that. D. Amina. Amino acid. Deamination. Okay, so you're going to remove that um, that ammonia off there, that amino group off there. Now, if you take that ammonia and convert it to something else, it's always going to cost you some energy. energy. But the Benny, the trade for using that energy, is that you can make something less toxic. Okay, so it requires less water. Okay, who's concerned about having enough water? What kind of organisms are concerned about water? The amount of water they have. What? Marine. What, yeah, because they live in a what kind of environment? Hypertonic, and they are hypo, and they tend to lose water. So that's going to be a big deal to them. Who else is concerned about water loss? Terrestrial. Terrestrial, because they live on land. It's dry. They're going to lose water. Now, it, who's not concerned about the amount of water they have? Freshwater. Freshwater, yeah, anything in the freshwater, freshwater fish, because they have plenty of water. Chances are they're hypertonic and the water is high totonic. So they have plenty of water to spin. So they don't need to use any energy converting it. And that's what we saw in this diagram right here. So here you have proteins. Proteins are built out of amino acids. When you break down an amino acid, you're going to have an amino group. The more energy you spend, the less water you need to get rid of it until you could have something like uric acid, like a bird would have, and that doesn't require what? Any water. So, and we know that if we have too much um, eat foods with too many purines, remember purines and primidines, okay? And if we have food with too much purines in it, that we can get too much uric acid. And then it precipitates out at, out at our joints, and then it's called what? Yeah. Gout. Who's most likely to get gout? Bacon eaters. An overweight, bacon-eating um, yeah. alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> Beer-drinking man. Okay. Yeah, they're most likely to get gout. All right. Oh, it's scurvy. <laughs> Why did I see? Well, maybe if that sailor just ate bacon. He could have scurvy and... Out. All right, anyway, so we looked at ammonia is aquatic animals, um, and then we looked at mammals and amphibians that you converted to urea, and chondriactes, those sharks, they convert it to urea, and then uric acid by birth. Okay, then. Okay, then. Oh, perfect, thank you. B, 
A movie star. Be a movie star for me. It's right here on the board. Classlab.com. No space. No space. Be a movie star. Star? Okay. Kank. Okay. Logan Lawrence is. Oh my god. I love Logan Lawrence. What is Kank? Kank? I think they meant Kank. I think they meant Kank. I'm not. I don't know. Oh, right now. Best picture. Somebody get a picture of Logan Lawrence. Why you would never just leave something on my desk like that? Because I would have no idea what that is. Okay. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Let me tell you something. In the picture that I had with this, there was a bird talking, and he was saying, what do I excrete? <laughs> yeah, and it was uric acid. But you personally, yes, you do secrete urea. The bird is missing. He's, he was sitting on a branch talking. I, I have to bring a bird in. My bad. All right. Um, yes. We also excrete ammonia. No, not, no, 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 not us, not common, yeah, our, our nitrogenous waste is urea, yeah, those other ones are not common, all right, come back to me, so let's look at some tubes, it's always about tubes and excretion, the first one we're going to look at is somebody you know and love, I skipped right over some things, like a unicellular organism, how are they going to excrete? Uh, right across their cell membrane, right? Nidaria, you know, they're going to secrete right across because all their cells are exposed to water. Okay, but here we have a multicellular organism, and the planaria, it's really not so much about nitrogenous waste as it is water balance. So they're in um, fresh water, water tends to come into them, they can move the water along. And typical planaria are these flame cells that be, you know, like undulate, kind of like a flame. That's why they call them flame cells. And it just moves the water along. Um, a step up, and probably the most similar to us, um, are the nephridia. Ooh, that sounds an awful lot like ours. What are ours called? Nephrons. Nephrons, yeah. And this is nephridia. And what they have is they have this nephrostome that it's like a vacuum cleaner, like when you put on an attachment, if you've ever vacuumed in your life, you put on a special attachment to do things. And it's, it reaches into the segment in front and picks up any fluid that's in there. And then that fluid, as it moves through um, the nephridia, there's something right next to it. What's right next to it, just like us? Right next to their waste tube. They have a closed circulatory system, capillaries, right? Remember that whole thing? So you have a blood, a blood tube right next to a waste tube, just like us, and anything that needs to be recovered goes into the blood, and anything that you want to get rid of goes into the waste tube. Okay, very similar to us. So when you see it right here, you can see, um, let me see if I have a better picture. Let me see. Okay, so we'll look at this one here, you can see the nephrostome. And you can see these tubes curling around and see how they have um, the capillary network along, much like our paratubular capillaries. 
right? And so you can pick up anything you need to recover, like reabsorption, capillaries in the middle, and then you can excrete whatever you need to. All right? Um, another example in insects, they have a different system because they have an open circulatory system. They have what's called malpighian tubules. Is a fly an insect? Yeah, it is. That's how I actually remember. No, it's not. It's a fish. Okay. Um, but I think about like insects, like a fly flying around a pig. I know it's stupid, but that's how I will remember Malpighian tubules. Bad pig, mall, bad pig, because I speak fluent Spanish. Um, bad pig, mall. Is it mall bad? Yeah, yeah. Mall is also in I French. knew that. I knew that because yeah. I'm fluent. Fluent. I'm fluent. I'm fluent. I'm fluent. Um, I'm fluent in Spanish. Oh, it's going to be a long day. Don't get excited tomorrow or expect your essays to be graded. I've graded one. Wait, 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 one person's or one, like, one person? One person. Was, was, <laughs> <laughs> was it good? It was Anisha. His was on top, period three. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was actually pretty good. But, um, oh, wait. Oh, 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 Anyway, I'm sure it's fine. I have lots of Anisha. I have plur I mean, <laughs> I'm really sorry. It's, it's a long day. I just, I want to apologize. Um, a lot of Anishas. Um, okay. It's a bit of a niche market. Help me now. All right. Anyway, Malpighian tubules extend out into the open circulatory system and again, um, absorb anything um, that might be in those fluids and out of your intestines here, kind of their gut, they'll reabsorb it back into that um, open, um, the interstitial fluid and then anything it doesn't want will go out the, um, the rectum anus area. This, this, it's a very dry waste because they'll reabsorb all that water out and their metabolic waste is what? Uric acid. Yeah, uric acid. All right, so that was a really long bird walk. Then the next thing we talked about is osmoregularity. Um, water is always going to move. Water must flow from the hypo. hypo. Can we ever actively move it? No. 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 We can actively transport other items to create a hypertonic environment, and water must flow. If you live in salt water, you're gonna live in an environment um, high in salt. You're gonna always tend to lose water. If you live in fresh water, it's <coughs> low in salt. You're gonna tend to lose salts and um, gain water when you live in fresh water. So then we looked at one example, and these are marine invertebrates, so they have no backbone, right? And um, these tend to be isotonic to their environment, um, especially when you look at things that live in an estuary. Do you remember what an estuary is? It can get both fresh and what? Salt, salt water, yeah. So they have to be able to you know, go with whatever their environment is. Um, they tend to be isotonic to their environment. Chondriichthys, um, sharks, um, cartilaginous fish, they tend to be isotonic as well, but not due to salts to keep them up and be isotonic. What do they use? High urea. High urea content, exactly. So that their, their blood um, concentration is equal to the um, environment around them. So their, their cells and tissues must be more tolerant of that higher content than what we are. Okay, that's an adaptation they have. Okay, then you have to uh, look at freshwater and saltwater fish. So marine fish, they're thirsty, so they drink water. But what comes in with that water? Salt, salt comes in with that water. Okay, um, so they have to work at excreting the salts, but the only place they can do that is where their circulatory system comes in contact with the outside environment, and that's always gonna happen at the gills, yeah. <coughs> at the capillaries, remember the lamellae of the gills, and we know all about countercurrent and all of that, right? But they will act, that doesn't have anything, countercurrent and water and oxygen doesn't have anything to do with this, right? It's totally different. That's, that's in order to get oxygen, this is to get rid of waste. So they will actively excrete that takes energy to get rid of that excess salt they get in with drinking water. And then they have scanty means very little. 
They don't pee a lot because they're trying to hold as much water in as, as they possibly can. Similar to you early in the morning, your, your urine, you might have a lot of it, but it's very, very what? Con moist, good. <laughs> very, I don't even want to know. Concentrated, very, this just, you know, this whole thing should be just not even posted. Um, this, he's white out for this presentation. It, it's very concentrated because you haven't had an influx of water throughout the, throughout while you've been sleeping. And so you're reabsorbing as much water as you can. That's what the fish is trying to do here. It can't afford to um, pee any water out. And it loses water at its gills passively, stuff it can't even help, because the water in its blood is hypotonic to the environment around them. Conversely, a freshwater fish has the opposite problem. They tend to lose salts at their gills. They don't need to drink water because water is moving in through their gills all the time. They have to actually take up salt because they tend to just lose salt, so they will take it up. They don't drink, and they pee copious amounts. And then in the presentation, you can review it. There are some different um, part, you know, different comparisons. But I, now that you understand a glomerulus, I want you to think about this. Now that you understand a glomerulus, can you understand that now? Could a uh, slate or or glue, if you feel more comfortable, explain that? <laughs> For us, were you just shaking your head just to shake your head? For us, where does filtration take place? Okay, good job. Um, we're in the kidneys. Good job, nephron. We're in the nephron. <laughs> Glomerulus. Glomerulus, right? We have filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, and excretion, right? So glomerular filtration, if you're in an area, okay, where you don't have a lot of water, are you going to want to push a lot out? No. If you're in an area where you have plenty of water, you're going to want to push a lot out? Yes. Okay, so their filtration rate is high if you're in fresh water because you can afford to push a lot out. But if not, you're in seawater, and it's not the same setup as we have exactly, okay? But they're not gonna want to push out as much because they can't afford, because they would have to work really hard at recovering all of that. Yes? I'm just a little, if it says filtration rate, didn't you say that for seawater, since there is salt, that they have to filter out the salt? Wouldn't that mean? That's not what they're filtering out. Not what they're filtering out at all. Okay, so here, what this is talking about is, like, what's going on at the glomerulus is how, how hard are you going to push? How much fluid are you going to push out? And, it, and it's going into your Bowman's capsule, right? So if you have plenty of water, you don't care if you push a bunch out because you don't care if you get it all recovered. You have plenty of water. But if you're low on water, you don't want to push that much out of your blood because you're trying to keep some of it. Okay? All right. Then we talked about really amazing osmoregulators are salmon because they spend part of their life fresh water. It's not like they switch once. It's like they start in fresh water and then they move to salt water and then they come back to fresh water. So those are really good examples of, um, of an osmoregulator because they can go back and forth. Let's see what this is. Let's rock shot the stop.
No, what do they excrete? Uric acid. Muy bueno. One advantage of urea excretion over uric acid excretion is that urea, what? Yes. Um, then uric acid. However, it requires more energy than, but less water than ammonia. Okay, got it in your head? Okay. What? Do you need me to say it again? So that's a good essay question. Oh, it is. Oh, this might be a really good one, too. Freshwater bony fishes maintain, so freshwater, so let's be a freshwater bony fish. That means that they are probably what? Uh, hypertonic. Okay. All right. So if he is hyper, water must flow from the hypo. So water is going to tend to want to flow into him. He's going to want to have what? A lot of pee. Because okay. water is going to be flowing into him all the time. And um, he's going to be excreting hypotonic urine. Right? All right, terrestrial animals tend to lose both water and ions to the environment. True statement. Um, water in through, we eat, and we get water as a result of metabolism. Why? Ana, na, 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 na. Who catches the electrons at the bottom? Oh my gosh, who catches the electrons at the bottom? Oxygen forming water. Okay, so we get, we get water from metabolism, we get water from what we eat. How do we lose water? Evaporation from our skin, from our lungs, from feces, um, and then from pee. Okay, that's what, those are all the ways we lose water. Um, if you look at this, as we go through some of the systems, this should make a lot of sense to you. So here's a cell. The cell is surrounded by tissue fluid. The tissue fluid interacts with the blood, right, in the capillaries. And then we can look at the way some of these other things interact with the blood. Like across your gut, what you absorb. Where does most absorption take place? Good, small intestines. Lungs, right? Water. Um, kidneys, we know about that. Your skin, you can lose. It can evaporate out. And then urea and bile from the liver. So those are some different ways that we interact with our external environment and what systems interact with that environment. Kangaroo rat's kind of unique. It doesn't drink its whole life. It can just get all the water it needs from the metabolism of the grains that it eats. I have a salt gland. Okay, so that's how he gets rid of excess salt when he is uh, out in that environment. Skin adaptations to prevent water loss. Um, and hydrobiosis. Those are pretty cool. Basically, they just lose all their water, right? Um, and then they can live in that state until they have water available to them again. <laughs> and camel. Camels have <laughs> camels have these really, really, really curved inside nostrils, so as the moisture leaves, they keep recovering water out of it. Same thing, picking up water on the way in. Okay, yeah, we're not doing that, and we're not doing that. <laughs> Oh, let's keep going. We can maybe do a more. Do you want to do it? No, really. We don't have to do it. I want to learn. Yeah. I want to learn. Okay. Yes. We have time. We'll do it at the end. Okay. 
Okay, then structure. So all we have to do is do the human one now. Just the human. Um, so you know kidneys, and kidneys drain into? Ureters. Ureters, Ureters drain into the? Ureters. Bladder, and the bladder is for? Storage, and then out the urethra, okay? Kidney, cross-section, what are the three parts to it? Cortex, medulla, pelvis. What is the functional unit for excretion? The nephron. How many do you have in each kidney? A million, a million plus nephrons in each kidney, okay? When we analyze the nephron, we know, I'm not gonna redo the analogy of the purse cleaning, you know that one, okay? <laughs> but we know that we have two pathways that go side by side. P path, blood path, Yes. okay? In our blood path, we have one, a unique situation. We have it in three places in our body. We've already studied one, here's the second one. We have double what? Capillaries. First set of capillaries, everything goes out. Second set of capillaries, things come back in, right? And if there's something we want to for sure get out, we can put it out then too, okay? We just need to be aware what, there's something unique in each one of these spots, right? There's a unique thing everywhere, okay? Where on here is only salt moving, only salt? Going up, right, okay? So the ascending loop it's, I'm gonna make red salt and blue water, okay? okay? So this is the one place where there's only salt on the ascending loop, only salt. I'm gonna go like this, okay? Only salt, okay? Where's the place where there is water only or water and urea? Descending is water only, I agree. So water gets reabsorbed here. Where else? Collecting dust. Collecting dust. Water gets reabsorbed, and so too does what? Urea. Not a lot. It's just because it's so concentrated at that point. So there's our water only and water and urea. Okay, where is salt and water? Where? Proximal convoluted tubule. You have salt and what? water okay so you have salt and water where else do you have something very similar to that distal convoluted tubule okay because you have again salt and then who follows it water but what else tubular secretion exactly so waste get put in at that point too. You understand what I'm doing? Okay, and then everything comes out where? I'm right here resting over it, <laughs> the glomerulus. So your nitrogenous waste come out then, what else comes out then? Your salt comes out then, what else comes out then? Water. Water, water, water comes out then. I don't know why I have a green right there. Do you know why I have a green I think right it's there? both, because you meant both. Or you I, just meant, I think I just screwed up. There we go. Oh, I thought it was colorful. Okay, colorful. and then um, we also have urea, right? Nitrogenous waste that come out then. So everything comes out then, right? Go ahead. Can we do like a little color for these things? Yes. Okay. This isn't a very good one. I, I never really, I guess. Here. <laughs> okay. Do you want it? Yeah, I was going to take salt. Water. Salt. Water. Um, I should have been a leprechaun and made green tea. That would have been perfect. Drop that. Urine. And what was this? Uh, that was um, waste. Or, yeah, toxins. <laughs> And tubular secretion. Thank you. Or drugs. Or creatine. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. And then here you can see all of those things labeled as well. Um, and you have plenty of diagrams in your book that show you that.
the afrin arterial yeah. goes, goes in what else could you tell me about the afrin arterial oxygenated dirty blood i like it what else could you tell me about the afrin arterial not the afrin but the afrin a ah, a so so we know the answer to this the afrin does exit the glomerulus but I'm asking you about the afferent one that enters the glomerulus. It has dirty oxygenated blood and it comes from the renal artery. I'm looking for something else. <coughs> what? Yes, there's something about a hormone. What? Renin, when it detects what? No, 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 no. Lower blood pressure. Lower blood pressure. Remember that? Okay. Okay, so then that, oh, whoa, 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 Linton, is it still going to be there? Yes. Okay. Next question. Filtration is a, oh, what is up, you two? Okay, so um, only at the glomerular capsule, right? Filtration. Check your bio buddy screen right now, because two people super struggled. You need, oh, Ori. Ori. <laughs> it's because Kang was taking his notes for him. He wasn't paying attention. Kang's not even here. <laughs> no, in class. Um, in humans, good, y'all. Y'all got that. Nice. Oh. Yeah, active transport. Mm -hmm. Okay. Homeostasis. <laughs> now look at this. This was a summary I showed you at the beginning, but then we went through and flushed all these out, right? So when we look at this, metabolic waste, urea, most common. Creatinine comes from what? Creatine phosphate, which stores energy in our muscles. And then uric acid could come from what? Purines. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> remember these three? Yes. Urea, creatinine, and uric acid. You remember this? Eat your steak, digest it in your what? Stomach. And in your small intestine. <laughs> what is that in your organ? Stomach. Your stomach and your intestines. And then you absorb it and you send it via your... Hepatic portal vein to your <laughs> liver, and your liver will do starts with a D deamination, removing the amino, amino group <laughs> and then converting it to uh, 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 urea. urea. And it'll put that urea back in your blood, which will go back to your heart, which will go to your lungs, which will go back to your heart, and then back out to your body again. But this time it might hit the kidney, mm. and, the, and the kidney, and the kidney will filter it out. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So that is how we get this 
waste right here, urea. Little thing, your liver does it by taking two amino groups and hooking it up with a CO2. See that? Yeah, okay. Ah, I'll keep going if you want to stay. Um, creatine phosphate is how you store um, phosphate in your muscles. And then when you're done, you have creatine or creatinine, two end products. Um, uric acid, we don't make too much of, but if we eat foods that are high in um, purines, then we can end up getting gout. Then that brings us to hello kidney. And what's the link between salt and blood pressure? Okay, yeah, more salt in your blood means more blood volume, which means higher blood pressure. Good. Okay, and we talked about ways to recover water. You all leaving? No, no. Okay, ways to recover water is ADH, which stands for anti diuretic hormone, which is secreted by your posterior pituitary gland. And then that will um, impact your collecting duct. Anti-di on the collecting duct. It's like the last thing out of the nephron. It's like, oh, we better reabsorb some water. If I have more ADH, am I gonna pee less or pee more? I'm gonna pee less. Because I'm gonna reabsorb that water. Um, sweetheart, are you waiting to hand me that container? Oh, it's okay. That's okay, baby. All right, so I'm gonna, um, I'm going to pee less if I have more ADH. We also talked about pH and how we have other things. We have our medulla oblongata. We have how you can make bicarbonate or carbonic acid, and that can help regulate our pH. But slower but more effective is your ability to just get rid of bicarbonate or recover hydrogen ions to get your pH just right. Okay, um, And you can do that in, at your paratubular um, capillaries. Okay, then the last thing was several different hormones. Remember this part? Yes. Okay, so that was the end thing. Aldosterone affects the kidneys, but let's just go to the start, okay? Or here, wait, you know what, let's go here. It's probably easier. Now that we understand it all. You so understand this. Where's your stupid cross? <laughs> I kind of forgot what I understood. All right, so when you need to reabsorb more water, what ends up happening is, remember you have that inactive precursor, angiotensinogen, and that renin, which gets secreted from your kidneys, you know, specifically your afferent, or sorry, yeah, afferent arterial is like, oh, blood pressure too low, we're not gonna filter enough here. So then your kidneys secrete renin, and renin will convert that angiotensinogen into angiotensin one. But we're not done. Because we need something from the lungs. lungs. We're not done. We need something from the lungs. And the lungs converts it from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And then here, here's angiotensin 1, here's angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 talks to the adrenal cortex, and the adrenal cortex will secrete aldosterone, and aldosterone will tell the kidneys reabsorb more sodium, which then water gets recovered. Yes, What's which increases blood volume, which increases blood pressure. Yes. Do we need to know the enzyme that comes from the lungs? Say, say again? Do we need to know the converting enzyme that comes from the Oh, ACE the from the lungs? That's okay. what it is. Yeah, oh sorry. I thought I had said it. I forgot. Yes. Okay. So after more sodium is absorbed, what was the last part? I didn't catch Oh, okay. Sodium gets pumped. Chlor chlorine or the chloride ion has to follow it because the opposites attract. You, you're not gonna need, an, it's really salt. I mean, you say sodium, but think of it as sodium chloride. And then water will follow that salt. Now, another way you can get aldosterone secreted is from your anterior pituitary who secretes adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH. And that will also make your adrenal gland <laughs> well, <yeah>. um, <laughs> absorb more water, too. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, and we know that if our blood pressure can be too high or too low, it can also be too high. So counteracting all of that, it's detected in your atria, and we're remembering that because we're thinking the blood pressure should be the lowest getting dumped into the atria because that's the return point, right? And blood always is going to move the highest 
pressure to the lowest. So if it's coming in fast and furious into our atria, we're going to have an issue. So then that's going to secrete that ANF or ANH or AN, what's another one, P, whatever that hormone is. And then that will tell, do the opposite of everything we just described. And this is, again, this relates back to your endocrine system, which is one of your mandated systems you need to know. And these would be contrary hormones, right? Just like insulin and glucagon. You know what insulin does, right? Yes. Lowers blood glucose. Yes. Glucagon will raise it from your islets of Langerhans in your pancreas, alpha and beta cells. Okay, now here's another one that shows you um, the interaction between all of these things. We can see ANH, no to ADH, no to the renin, okay? But here you can see that whole renin angiotensin II connection. Um, you can see how the pituitary gland, those are not testes, but the pituitary gland impacts the um, kidneys as well. Okay, and then, look at the children looking in. Oh, Sean. Um, and then here we have EPO, which this is kind of cool to think about because your kidneys care a lot about your blood pressure, right? And here they're even contributing blood cells um, by secreting EPO, which affects your bone marrow. And last but not least is um, how you, the kidneys help in activating vitamin D, which then impacts our calcium reabsorption out of our kidneys, which can help with your brain, nerves, blood clotting, so many things. All right? Um, if we saw that, would we know what everything does and what everything is? Shall we practice? We shall. Okay. You want to just, let's, should we do an alphabetical order? Because that would really test us. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Let's start with A. What is that? Glomerulus. And what does it do? Yeah, it receives everything, right? Okay. Where? What's B? Afferent or efferent? Afferent. Efferent. Oh, it. So that's the efferent. B is the efferent arterial. It's going away. Um, and then where? Where C? C is the afferent arterial. Then going towards. And we know it's important because that's also going to detect the blood pressure, which can then trigger to secrete renin. Um, where's D? Proximal, proximal convoluted tubule. Let's talk about what happens there. Salt, Salt and water. water. The majority of it, right? Uh -huh. Okay. And then where is E? E is down here. Oh, oh, we got a double for D for E. E is called the loop of the nephron, but F is the descending loop. What comes out there? Water. And G is the ascending loop. What comes out there? Salt only, right? Yes. Okay. And then F, G, A, B, C, D, F, G, H is the paratubular, paratubular capillaries. And they're taking back, right? Recovering, um, tubular reabsorption, H, I. Where's I? I is the distal convoluted tubule. What's happening there? Salt, water, tubular secretion. Getting rid of things like creatine, creatinine, drugs, okay? Um, H, I, where's J? Oh, good job. Renal vein. What could you tell me about the blood in the renal vein? Clean, Clean and, and deoxygenated. Okay, H-I-J-K, that is the renal, renal artery. And what could you tell me about it? Dirty, Dirty but oxygenated. K-L, what's this? Collecting duct. What do we know about the collecting duct? Water reabsorption. What else? Some urea. Who impacts it? Oh, oh, it's the ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone, which comes from the pituitary gland. Okay, you feeling strong? That was a good little, good little test. Okay. Um, you good? Okay. Here's another question or two for you. I think. Only one question.
we might be only at 34% because the bell rang. Do you want you in? Yeah. <laughs> only one of you missed it. The presence of ADH causes an individual to excrete less water, right? Because you're reabsorbing it. The end. Yay. Yay for you. Do you feel smarter? Yes. yes. Good. I'm proud of you. Super proud of you. Have a piece of toast. Drink some water. You want to avoid kidney stones. I hear those are terribly painful.